وينشر الهدي إيمانا وموعظة فبالجهالة قد خابت مساعينا خابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا خابت مناقبنا واسود حاضرنا وأوشك اليأس أن يغشى أمانينا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to another edition of the Sulaiman Ravid Show. Last week, Friday, was a public holiday. This week, Friday, is not a public holiday, but uh, it uh, signals the end of the first term, the first term in the school calendar, at least. And although the majority of us don't go to school, the majority of you watching this program this evening don't go to school, but we have children or we have grandchildren uh, that go to school and as a result it kind of like impacts on us because you plan your leave around the school holidays you plan your your breaks your weekend aways your family functions around school holidays can you believe it can you believe it one term has just gone a quarter of the year is uh, is is gone and uh, it 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 will uh, it, it will never return whatever passes in your life will never come back every second that passes in your life will never come back we are an accumulation of seconds. Each one of us has come with a stipulated number of seconds for which we will live. And every second that passes away is a second that will never come back. And how do we ascertain and how do we gauge, how do we uh, determine whether we have wasted that second or whether we have uh, utilized that second constructively? Uh, for example, Abdullah bin uh, Mas'ud radiallahu anhu used to say, I look at every day in my life and I do an assessment. I ask myself at the termination and completion of each day in my life, I ask myself the question, has this day brought me closer to Allah or not? Has this day brought me closer to Allah or not? We're not talking about a day that has taken you away from Allah. A day that, you know, you spent in the disobedience of Allah. That goes without saying. If it was a day wherein you remain on your normal level of relationship with Allah, he would consider that as a wasted day. Only a day wherein he became closer to Allah would he consider that as a productive day. Now, obviously, that's a very high standard, and that's a, a very high level. And each of us might not be able to judge ourselves according to that level now, but we can um, aspire for that level. Why is it that in material things, we aspire for the highest? You know, you'll be driving a Mercedes, but you'll be looking at the man with a Ferrari. You'll be living in your own home. You won't be looking at a man who's struggling to pay rent. You'll be looking at a man who's, an, who's in an affluent suburb. You'll be looking at a man who's got a home with a pool. You'll be looking at a man who's got a beach flat. So when it comes to material things, we always aspire for, for more. We want more. We're never satisfied with the status quo. But when it comes to uh, matters of spiritual progress, matters of spirituality, matters of deen, religious matters, we're very satisfied with the status quo. We are willing to defend the status quo. We are willing to uh, we even compare ourselves to those who are doing less. When at least I'm doing this. Look at that person. He's not even doing that. So that's not the approach of a life of a Muslim. Uh, in, uh, uh, that's not the approach of a Muslim to life. A Muslim in life must value every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month. And these, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, but these, these moments in the calendar, you know, that, uh, that, that, depart, that, that divide the calendar, uh, whether it be terms or whether it be holidays or whether it be, uh, you know, the, the, the whole 12-month cycle, it's a reminder to us. These things ought to be a reminder to us that, you know what, just, just the other day, we were, we were talking about December, we were enjoying December. Uh, just the other day, we were talking about the beginning of the year, and now we are three months down. We are three months down. A quarter of the year is gone, 25%. If I had four sweets, one is gone. I only got three left. If we want to put it uh, simply for, for those who are, who are younger, with children, to explain to them the value of time. Now, we need to ask Allah wa ta'ala that in these three months, whatever little we have done, Allah accepts, and whatever the deficiencies and weaknesses were, that Allah wa ta'ala uh, 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 overlooks and, and forgives, and that the next three months are even more productive and even more fruitful and even more... Uh, constructive in terms of what we achieve and in terms of uh, what we do. So yes, let's hope that uh, we can value time. Allah wa ta'ala takes an oath on time. Asr. Allah wa ta'ala only takes an oath on th those things which are important, those things which, which are value. And time in many ways is our greatest asset.
Also, uh, holiday time, I mean, I'm not going to go into a lengthy discussion. Every year, the end of the year in December, when you have the long break and the lengthy holiday, we go into a, uh, we dedicate an entire program talking about uh, etiquettes of holidays and the things that we need to keep in mind for the holiday season, etc. But I want to say this much, that oh, younger ones out there, students and those of you are on holiday or those elder ones who are going to go and leave, you can never go on holiday from Islam. You are Muslim wherever you are. The rules of Allah apply. Maybe a little differently, for example, if you're on holiday and you're a musafir, your salah is half, but your salah is not maf, as I, I mentioned in December as well. So there may be certain concessions, there may be rulings that apply slightly differently, but by and large, you are still a Muslim. You cannot stand before Allah on the day of Qiyam and say, oh Allah, uh, you know what, that, that happened during the school holidays. No, 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 no. This was part of your life. You were sent to this world with the instruction to obey Allah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I've created men and jinn to worship me. I've created men and jinn to worship me. This is what Allah Taala mentions. So what we need to understand, and what is vital, as parents now I'm talking, is that don't just say, okay, holidays, eh, the nags are going to be at home. Normally in the morning, then school, in the afternoon, then madrasa. Now they're going to be at home. Oh, tell the husband, take them to the shop. Your husband says, no, you keep them here. They, they run a mock there in the shop. No, no, don't look at them as a burden. Look at it as in a positive way. All right, they're at home. How can I get them into something constructive? Don't overburden them now. Don't get them too involved in schoolwork. There's a point behind a holiday, and that is you must have a bit of, uh, of a break. Uh, do things, do different things. No, don't do the same things. So, in, uh, make, make, ensure that uh, you, 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 you have a timetable. You have a plan for your children. They are going to be away. I think it's only one week in most provinces because after that, there's a number of public holidays that come up. And also, you know, we're going to a whole different season here in South Africa. We're moving towards the elections. And uh, from next week onwards, we'll be hearing a lot about elections on this particular program. It's, uh, it's, it's necessary. It's important. We have to do it. Uh, and it's part of our, 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 our contribution towards the country wherein we live. So we need to make that, uh, that, that contribution. But what I'm saying is have a timetable, have a plan of action, apply your minds, husband and wife, interact with the children so that their time is spent differently but constructively. Differently but constructively. Coming up this evening on the program, as usual, we start with our dua, our supplication for the week. Then we discuss a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today we talk about helping your brother whether, whether, whether he's an oppressor or an oppressed person, whether he's the victim or he's the perpetrator. That is one of the discussions that uh, we will be having. We talk about reflecting and pondering on the meaning of the Qur'an. That is part of our tafsir discussion. The verse, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran, And why the Qur'an is definitely the word of Allah and why the Qur'an is miraculous in its nature. And as far as our series is concerned, today we, we wrap up that discussion. Uh, that has come just after the biographies of the ancestors of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with regards some of the distinguishing qualities of the Arabs. Uh, we spoke last week about uh, their memory and, and their generosity. This week we speak about uh, their patriotism, uh, this kind of uh, tribal pride, as well as uh, their eloquence in the Arabic language. Uh, last week we didn't get a t chance to have our uh, marital tip for the week. I know many people look forward to that segment. We'll have that discussion this week. Watch who you talk to, watch, watch who you talk to, and we'll conclude once again uh, with our sunnah for the week. And we have been running the theme for the last two or three weeks now on the rights of a guest. <laughs> Welcome back. We now discuss our dua and supplication for the week. Last week we discussed a supplication taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where in the primary request, uh, centers around uh, ease. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to grant us ease. Allahumma altuf bina fi taysiri kulli asir, fa inna taysira kulli asirina alayka yasir, wa nas'aluka al yusra wal mu'afata fi dini wa dunya wal akhira. Where we say, oh Allah, through your grace, uh, ch ch change every difficulty of ours into ease. Uh, because to change a difficulty into ease is easy for you. And then we conclude the dua by saying, وَنَسْأَلُكَ الْيُسْرَ وَالْعَافِيَةَ فِي الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةَ That, O oh Allah, we ask you for ease in matters pertaining to our deen, in matters pertaining to our dunya, and in matters pertaining to our, our year after. And I explained last week that you can achieve things, but you can achieve things with ease or you can achieve things with difficulty. We gave the example of sustenance. Some people, Allah spreads their sustenance all over. They have to work lengthy days, they have to travel very far, they have to, um, you know, de to deal with a lot of stress. And then 
they, 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 they secure their livelihood. Others, one or two small deals here and there, big profits, they, they're smiling. That, that is just one example. Uh, it's a challenge to earn a sustenance. It's a challenge to do business. So we say, oh Allah, make ease, grant me ease in this challenge of minds. Because to take a total difficulty and hardship and turn it into ease, that's easy for you because you have control over everything. You have power over everything. So in whatever we do, we must ask Allah wa ta'ala for peace, for ease, uh, for tranquility. Uh, there mustn't be difficulty, there mustn't be hardship, there mustn't be obstacles. This is something that uh, is very critical and this is something which is important. So the dua we discussed last week, Allahumma al-tuf bina fi taysiri kulli asir, fa inna taysira kulli asirina alayka yasir, wa nas'aluka al-yusra wal-afiyata fi al-deeni wa dunya wal-akhira. The hadith that we discussed, or rather the dua that we discussed this week is from the Qur'an. From Surah Banu Israel, where Allah wa ta'ala teaches us a very important dua, a famous dua, a dua that many of us would have heard, but a dua that many of us don't make. Rabbi arham huma kama rabbayani saghira. Rabbi arham huma kama rabbayani saghira. Oh my Allah, oh my creator, my sustainer, my nourisher, my cherisher, my beloved Allah, have mercy on my parents like they had mercy upon me when I was small. Have mercy on my parents like they had mercy upon me when I was small. It is one of the rights of your parents that you make dua for them, whether they are alive or whether they have passed away. And here we ask Allah to have mercy on them. When Allah has mercy on someone, then that person's worldly life uh, becomes easy and that person can be successful in this world as well as in the year after. Now, if you look at the relationship between the parent and the child, especially when you were young, your father had to work very hard to ensure there was food in your belly to ensure that you were educated, to ensure that you were clothed, to ensure that uh, you had the amenities in life. Your mother had to bath you, she had to dress you, she had to feed you, she had to clean you, she had to nurse you, she had to nurture you, she had to teach you, she had to reprimand you, and the list goes on and on, but they did it with mercy. They did it with mercy. The love and the mercy that Allah puts in the heart of, especially the mother and parents in general, towards the children is absolutely remarkable. And it's, it's, it's essential. Uh, for the, uh, you know, for mankind to continue, for the continuation of the human race, because if parents, by and large, all together, all of them did not care about their children, what would become of this world? It, it would be chaos. They are obviously, many parents who don't, you hear about the dumping of, of children, the abuse of children, but there is this natural quality which Allah wa ta'ala has placed in their hearts, and they show a lot of mercy, a lot of tolerance, a lot of um, uh, effort they put in. So we say, well, Allah, they did all of that for us when we were small. Our, our, one of the ways that we show gratitude to them, O oh Allah, is we make dua to you that now you show mercy to them. Because now they're progressing in age. I'm now moving towards my, 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 my prime, the, you know, where I'm young and I'm independent. That, that life cycle is starting to kick in for them. Where they now moving towards the age where they also become dependent on others. Like I was dependent on them when I was young. Because towards the end of your life, as the Quran mentions, uh, you become like how you were in the beginning. Others have to feed you and clothe you and, <clears throat> and clean you. So Allah, you have mercy on them. And even if they're not in that particular stage of their life, whatever the case may be, whether even if they have passed on, Allah, you have mercy on them. I'm asking you. So number one, you're making a dua, which will benefit your parents. But at the same time, it will benefit you because you are fulfilling one of the rights of your parents. And apart from fulfilling one of the rights of your parents, it benefits you because Allah will reward you for making, uh, making dua for your parents. Allahumma rabbi rahamhuma kama rabbayani sakhira. What a, what a simple dua, what an easy dua to memorize in the 15th juz of the Quran Kareem, Surah Bani Israel. And at the same time, so important and, and so full of reward and so full of benefit, not only for the person on whose behalf the dua is being made, but also for the person who is making the dua. Both of them are going to benefit from this, uh, from this supplication. And this request that is put forth to Allah wa ta'ala. And this dua reminds us that our parents have rights over us. Even though we may have become independent, even though we may have married and moved on, so to speak. Now, you know what? I'm married and I'm in my husband's house. Or I'm independent. You know, I've got my own uh, business. I've got my own children to worry about. Yeah, life does change. I mean, your relationship... Especially from a practical sense, you may not be, no longer be living in the same house. You, know, you may no longer be interacting on the same level, etc. But all of that aside, all of that, uh, you know, on its place, they are still your parents. They still have rights over you. You have obligations that you need to fulfill. 
And in the end of the day, the making dua for them is the minimum. Remember how much of dua they made for you. When you were sick, your mother would cry at night. Oh Allah, grant relief to my child. My child is, 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 is restless. My child is ill. Your mother would be making dua for you to pass your exam. Actually, parents make dua for their children right up till their last breath. That's why they say, when your parents go to the grave, that do, the door of dua has closed. When your parents go to the grave, that door of dua has closed. So this is something that uh, we need to keep in mind. And this is something that we can be cognizant of. We get too caught up in the rat race. Sometimes we get too caught up in the efforts of deen also. In the different efforts of uh, religious efforts. Good, good efforts. Noble efforts. That we forget our parents and we, we neglect them. May Allah ta'ala grant us the understanding. <laughs> Welcome back. We now move on to the second segment of our program where we discuss the ahadith, prophetic statements and actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last week we discussed a narration of uh, Ibn Majah where a sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu nasi afdal, who are the best of people? So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, listen, a person who has two qualities. Kullu makhmoom al-qalbi saduq al-lisan. A man who is makhmoom al-qalb, his heart is makhmoom. And he has a truthful tongue. So the Sahaba said, okay, truthful tongue, that's straightforward, we understand. But this mahmumul qalb, the person's heart must be mahmum. What does it mean? So the Nabi of Allah said, it means his heart must contain the following. He must be the following. That person must have taqwa. He must be conscious of Allah. He must have a pure heart that must be free of sin and the intention of sin. He must be free of injustice. He must be free of jealousy and he must be free of hatred. And we explained last week and, and the theme revolved and centered around uh, cleansing our hearts, having pure hearts. Because in the end of the day, we cleanse everything else. We, we strive for excellence in everything else. We'll be shy to walk out in public with stains and, and, and marks and dirt and, and grime. On our clothing, we'll feel shy. We'll say, what do people think, to, uh, think of us? But on the day of Qiyamah, how will you present yourself before Allah? It will be your heart that will be presented before Allah wa ta'ala. So does it not perturb us? Does it not disturb us? Does it not worry us that uh, our hearts are not clean? Our hearts are not pure? Our hearts are not sound? And we have to present these hearts before Allah wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah. Then the second hadith which we discussed Last week, where is when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the Sahaba to not come and tell me about the wrongdoings and the shortcomings and the evils of others, because for inni uhibbu an akhruja ilaykum wa an asalimu sadri, I like to come to you when I meet you want to have a clean heart, clear heart, open mind, and we explained obviously at times when there was necessity or when there was going to be collective harm or by informing the Nabi of Allah there would be some sort of collective good, then there was justification to inform Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the wrongdoings of certain people, about the wrongdoings of, uh, of, of certain uh, individuals. Maybe they were plotting or planning something that would have an impact on others. So in those circumstances, it was perfectly legit and perfectly all right to inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in things that were of no relevance to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and here more so, the Nabi of Allah took this position so that we could learn a lesson. It would not really have impacted on him. But he's teaching us a lesson. Don't listen to gossip. Don't listen to people's stories about others that have no, no consequence or rather that have no relevance. Why? Because then your pure heart and your pure opinion of that person is going to get compromised. And, and your opinion of people should not be unnecessarily compromised. When you meet that person, now you sit and think, oh, okay, this is the same person. That one, that one told me this about that person. No, the Rabbi Allah said, I don't want to be involved in that. I want to meet people with a pure heart. Subhanallah. Now, the first hadith that we discussed for this uh, evening is a narration of Abu Dawood. And it talks about the relationship between two believers. And Abi Huraira radiyallahu anhu an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, Al-Mu'minu mir'atu al-Mu'min, wal-Mu'minu akhu al-Mu'min, yakuffu alayhi dayatahu wa yahootuhu min waraihi. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, one believer is a mirror unto another believer. And one believer is another believer's brother who guards him against loss and protects him in all aspects in his absence. 
Now, the Nabi of Allah has given a few indications here about what the relationship between two Muslim brothers ought to be. And we're not talking about blood brothers. We're talking about brothers in deen or sisters in deen. One is you ought to be a mirror unto one another. And the scholars have given different interpretations as to why this particular example has been given, this analogy. And uh, some of the examples, they say, look, a, a mirror does not lie. When you look into the mirror, you see what's there. When you look into the mirror, you see yourself. If your hair is untidy, it's going to look untidy. But if your hair is neat, it's going to look neat. So the, the mirror doesn't lie. So you must be an accurate reflection for your brother in terms of what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. Secondly, a mirror does not exaggerate. So if, if you have, uh, if, if you have a, you know, a short beard, it's not going to show it as a long beard. If you have a long beard, it's not going to show it as a longer beard. It shows it as is. So when you're praising your brother, don't exaggerate. When you're criticizing your brother as well, do not exaggerate. These are things that uh, we need to learn. The cleaner the mirror, the better and more accurate the reflection. So the cleaner and purer your heart, the more you are able to assist the next man in terms of his own, uh, own development. And others, other, other interpretations have been given. So, al-mu'minu mir'atul mu'min. A believer is a believer's mirror. Wal-mu'minu akhul mu'min. One brother is, one believer is a brother to another believer. Meaning you have a relationship, you have a link. Why do you call brothers brothers? Because they share the same mother and father, or they share at least one parent. So why, do you, why, why are Muslims referred to as brothers? Because you share the same deen. You believe in Allah in the same way. You believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the same way. And when, when you say that a Muslim is your brother, what, what are you now expected to do? يَكُفُّ عَلَيْهِ ضَيْعَتَهُ وَيَحُوتُهُ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ you should guard this person against loss and protect him in all aspects in his absence. Guard him against loss and protect him in all aspects in his absence. You, you mustn't say, well, okay, it's his business. No, try your utmost to help him, to, to, to protect him against loss. Obviously, that means you can't be the means of his loss, which unfortunately many of us are these days. And in his absence, protect him. Protect his interests. The man is gone. Look, have, you know, have a look at his house every now and then. You know, down the street, the man is gone, he's on holiday. Let me pass by, see the windows are okay, everything is okay. That is what a brother would do for a brother. And that is what one Muslim should do for another Muslim. The next narration is from Bukhari. Anas radiallahu anhu is in the narrator, he mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Unsur akhaka zaliman aw madhluman. Faqala rajulun, ya Rasulullah, ansuruhu idha kana madhluman. Afara'ita in kana zaliman, kayfa ansuru? Qal, the Prophet said, help your Muslim brother whether he is an oppressor or is oppressed. In other words, whether he is the perpetrator of oppression or the victim of oppression. So once Sahabi inquired and said, Ya Rasulullah, if he's the victim, we can understand that we are out to help him. But how do you help the perpetrator? How do you help the person responsible for the zulm? So the Nabi of Allah said, you stop or prevent him from oppression. For that is indeed helping him. Because if you caution him, you advise him, you counsel him, you motivate him that, no, this is wrong. Control yourself. Don't do this. Don't get physical. You're helping him. Because by him being a perpetrator of zulm, there are consequences in this world and there are consequences in the year after. And by you protecting him or assisting him in protecting himself, you're helping him because you, you're protecting him, you're assisting him in protecting himself from the consequences. So therefore, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, you must not only help your brother when he's the victim. That's the easy part. That's the obvious part. Help your brother when he's the perpetrator. That now takes courage. This is where you get people saying, no, I don't want to get involved. My husband says I mustn't get involved. I'm not saying that there, are, there aren't circumstances where due to the dynamics and due to the very specific conditions, it may not be a good idea for you, for you to get involved. That is there. But that's an exception. The rule is, you must not go and say, hey, listen, he's doing wrong. But with hikmat, with mawidatil hasana, as the Quran says, with wisdom, with good words, in a very mature way, you go and you address the situation. And you say, my brother, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. It's a very sensitive thing. It's like walking the pul sirat. You can yeah, put one toe wrong. And, and, and you can fall down because, hey, mind your own business. What's it got to do with you? You heard one side of the story. That's why I'm saying it has to be at the right time. The context must be right. The mood must be right. The place must be right. Uh, the temper must not be flaring at that time. So you don't just go and blurt things out and hurl accusations yourself. And then, like there was one man who used to write a lot of emails to me previously until I told him to stop. And he would start every email with this hadith. 
that help your brother whether he's the oppressor or the oppressed. So he was sitting in judgment now and saying that, right, as far as I'm concerned, here you are the perpetrator, you're wrong. So now you have to listen to me. That is obviously, you know, the wrong approach. Maybe the man was sincere. No, definitely he was sincere, but his approach was wrong. You could use a lot of hikmat and you could use a lot of wisdom. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. <laughs> Welcome back. We now move on to the tafsir segment. Last week we discussed a verse of Surah Al-An'am where Allah wa ta'ala describes this worldly life as play and amusement. And we explained that how do you reconcile that with the fact that the ulama always emphasize and tell us your life is a very precious bounty. Uh, this opportunity of life is an opportunity wherein we need to invest in the year after and how you live your life will depend on how you fare in the year after. And we explain that this is said from the perspective of those who don't believe in the actual life, which is the life of the year after. This life is very short. It's very temporary. It's, uh, it's imperfect. When you will be asked on the day of Qiyamah, how long did you live? You will say not even a day or a portion of the day. The actual eternal life is the life of the year after. So this world is not, an object, uh, is not a goal in itself. It's not an end in itself. It's a means towards an end. It's a means towards an objective. Hence, do not make the means the objective in itself. Uh, because that's where the element of play and amusement comes in. Those who make this worldly life the be-all and end-all, they become then hedonistic. And they then coin phrases that like, just do it. And, you know, you only live once and, you know, throw caution to the wind. So Allah wa ta'ala is, is rebuking and condemning that. And we gave the analogy last week. We said that, uh, that those children who are playing and, and in, in that play, they play in kitchen or whatever, they uh, they. They, 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 they're acting as if they're cooking. You know, young girls are playing. But meals time, they go to their mother because they understand that even though they are, they are cooking, but that is pretentious. It's superficial. It's not real food. That won't satiate their hunger. To, to satiate their hunger, they need real food. That's why they run to mommy, even though for two or three hours they were playing with the toy cups and the toy pans and the toy stove. So similarly, for the year after, we need real deeds, not superficial deeds. If a person is only busy in the superficial pleasures of this world, then, this, then your, your whole life will just play an amusement. And there are many people who lead that kind of a life. It's all about eating, drinking, sleeping, merrymaking, fulfillment of lust and desires. You know, very little difference between how we live our lives and how animals live their lives. Their lives revolve around the same. Sleep, eat, drink, and fulfill, the, fulfill your desires. So Allah wa ta'ala says the, life of, the actual life is the life of the year after. So when you use this life to prepare for that life, then you are utilizing this life constructively. Otherwise, this life is just a life of play and amusement, play and sport. So that's the verse that we discussed last week. The verse I want to discuss this week is a verse of Surah An-Nisa. It's just before the halfway mark of the 50, fifth Jews of the Quran Kareem. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, talking about the Quran and those who reject the Quran, he says, Afala yatadabbaroon al-Quran? Do they not ponder on the Quran? وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوْ وَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا If this Quran was from anyone besides Allah, you would find many inconsistencies, many variances, many discrepancies. Allah Taala says, don't you ponder? Look at the Quran. Understand something. No matter how intelligent you may be, or how mature you may be, or how prepared you may be, a human being has different emotions. So at times you're talking, but you're tired. At times you're talking, but you're fresh. And there'll be a variance. At times you're talking, but you're angry. At times you're talking, and you're, and you're happy. There'll be a variance. At times you're talking, but you're sad. At times you're talking, but you're cheerful. Again, there'll be a variance in your speech. When you're young and you don't have that much of experience, as compared to when you're a little older and you have more experience, there'll be a variance. When I listen to some of the recordings of, of the radio shows that I did some eight, nine years ago when I just started, then it's like, hey, am I listening to the same person? There's even a change in the voice, in the style, in the use of language. Because as you go, you develop. Salah wa ta'ala says, look at the Quran. There isn't that imbalance. There isn't that variance. There isn't that inconsistency. There isn't that discrepancy. There's perfection. There's consistency. There's balance. There's equilibrium. Therefore, it can only come from Allah. Allah is saying, you're not pondering. Then in terms of pondering over the content of the Quran, this is where we get very uh, confused. You have those who will say, well, if a scholar can study the Quran, why can't I study the Quran? 
if, the, if a scholar can pass a verdict from the Quran, why can't I pass a verdict from the Quran? You'll get those. And then you will get others who will say, no, you cannot study the Quran at all. It should only be studied by scholars. And both those viewpoints are wrong. The, as always, the truth lies in between on the middle path. In any field, you need experts. They are the ones who must, in, who must do the final interpretation. So I may, I may be better in the English language than a doctor. But I cannot pick up, pick up books on medicine in English and then start making medical decisions and having medical opinions when I don't have the background knowledge, when I don't have the tools that are necessary for me to be able to make those decisions. Um, and even an average doctor won't do it. He will simply follow in the footsteps of a more experienced and a more, uh, and, and, and a more knowledgeable doctor. Similarly, many ulama, myself included, we don't make tafsir of the Quran. We're not interpreting the Quran. We're narrating the tafsir of the Quran to you, which is found in, in the authentic and reliable tafsir of the great scholars of the past. Now, where does it leave the layman? Because sometimes people get confused. So what, I can't read any translation of the Quran or any interpret tafsir of the Quran? No, you can. But do it under the guidance of a scholar. And do not now take it to the point where you want to go into the intricacies and the, the technicalities and develop your own points. You want to do that, then become a scholar. If you have that thirst, then become a scholar. So I can't start saying to my wife, now you know what, I, I read so many books and medicine, I'm going to give you the injection. Because... I might just, I might just give a, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I might just make one mistake uh, because I don't have the elementary knowledge. I haven't been through the processes. I haven't sat in the company of doctors, even though my English might be better than them. And I read all those books. Now I feel no. So similarly, to read so that your own understanding is enhanced, your own knowledge is un uh, enhanced, your horizons, in as far as the content of the Quran are broadened, that's fine. But consult with the scholars and say, right, which book should I read? Because some books are a bit more technical in nature, uh, more jurisprudic in nature. Others focus more on the broader concepts of the Quran. And then whatever you don't understand, you go to your scholar and you say, explain this to me. This seems to be uh, in contradiction to that. Rather than now trying to, be an, to, to, to portray yourself as an expert. That, that's the key thing. And that's how you find the balance. And Allah wa ta'ala says, but overall, look at the Quran and its miraculous nature. No other book is memorized like the Quran. No other book is preserved like the Quran. No other book is taught like the Quran. No other book is practiced like the Quran. No other book is propagated like the Quran. Why don't you take lesson and ponder? If it was from anyone besides Allah, you would have found a lot of uh, uh, variances and a lot of inconsistencies in it. Hence, each one of us, we, we need to ask ourselves, what is the state of my relationship with the Qur'an? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us, if you want to reach Allah, and that's the dream of every believer, there are different ways of reaching Allah. But the most effective and the quickest way of reaching Allah is through the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is the word of Allah. And therefore, it's the quickest way to reach Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. May Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, last week on our series segment, we, were, we continued the discussion from the previous week on the distinguishable qualities and attributes of the Arabs. And we, we, we were discussing now about the Arab prior to the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we said that they were extremely generous. They would, they would sacrifice a healthy camel uh, for an unexpected guest. They would go hungry just to ensure that their guests were, were, were satiated and well looked after. Then we spoke about their memory and they said, you know, we, uh, we explained that, you know, look at the poems that they, that they wrote and they memorized and, you know, how much they could, they could absorb and retain in their memory. It was absolutely phenomenal. Previously, we spoke about how they would memorize their own lineage and the lineage of even their horses and camels. That should tell you about the phenomenal capacity of their memories. Now, today we're going to talk about their self-esteem. Some would say, you know, their, 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 um, you know, their, their tribal love. It was, uh, it, it was found to savage levels. Anybody who, you know, for a moment interfered with the tribe, even the inter-tribe rivalry within, uh, within the Quraysh, you know, slight provocation and the hostilities would continue for years. The father would be on his deathbed and the only thing he'll tell his son was that, uh, you know what, continue this fight, continue this fight. One's camel will go and graze in another one's uh, area, and for years they'll fight, and so much of blood will be spoiled, will be spilled. So this, this sense of self-esteem and personal honor. 
Then another distinguishing quality that they had is that they were very eloquent in their language. Arabic by its nature is, 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 is the most eloquent knowledge, uh, language. You'll find books on, on the Arabic language pertaining you know, to, to eloquence only, exclusively and, and specifically. And, and they were very eloquent. They had mastered the language. They were masters in poetry. And that's why it was their, it was, it was their ability. The, every Nabi had a miracle that was relevant to his time. Medicine was at its peak in the time of Isa alayhi salam. Allah created Isa alayhi salam without a father. Magic was at its peak in the time of Musa alayhi salam. Allah showed uh, the people how Musa alayhi salam could defeat the magicians. Poetry and eloquence in Arabic was the was the was the, uh, the was speaking at the time, and Allah sent the Quran, which dumbfounded the the most uh, noble and, and or rather the most uh, uh, capable of all of all poets. Now the point here that the scholars have written is that they had these qualities. Sometimes they would use these qualities for good and sometimes they would use these qualities for, for, for evil. So when they were blessed with Iman, then the very qualities that they were using for evil, they could now utilize those qualities for good. In their very memories were now used to retain the Quran, retain the hadith of Rasulullah that, that self-esteem and personal honor was used not to fight now tribes, but to find the enemy of Islam, that this is my Muslim brother. You don't dare touch him and I'm going, to, I'm going to assist him and I'll be there to back him up. There's a very important point that the scholars have made mention of. They said the Arabs prior to the birth of Rasulullah they were, in, they were corrupt in terms of their behavior and deeds. They were corrupt in terms of their behavior and deeds, burying their children alive, making tawaf of the Kaaba naked. But in terms of their innate talents, their disposition, their character, their morals, they, 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 were, they were more than decent human beings. And that's why Allah wa ta'ala chose them. And the, the final messenger was to come from them. Because it's easy to change your deeds. A person is stealing, it's easy to get him to stop steal, stealing. But if a person is stingy, very difficult to change that. If a person is, uh, is, is harsh, very difficult to change that. If a person is, uh, you know, what you call it, uh, swearing, it's easy to get that person to stop swearing. But if a person is, uh, is, is, is narrow-minded, very difficult to change that. So the Quraysh were weak when it came to actions. They were involved in many wrongful actions. But when it came to qualities, they were strong. And that is why Allah wa ta'ala chose them. Now that was a bit of a discussion that we had just after discussing the biography of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Next week, we commence with a discussion on the biography of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father, Abdullah. And then obviously, we progress and we start talking about the actual birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Welcome back. We now discuss our marital tip for the week. Last week we didn't have a discussion to discuss, uh, an opportunity rather to discuss marriage. But what we do this week is that uh, we recap the, 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 the point of the week before where we spoke about uh, women's weapon of mass destruction, which is uh, silent treatment. And we said that uh, be, be very careful in that uh, regard. Sometimes you may feel that you're achieving something, that okay, I'm getting him anxious, I'm getting him worried, I'm getting him frustrated. Ultimately, he's gonna come begging to me, please speak, please say something. But that's not a mature way. In the long term, it doesn't work. In the short term, maybe you get to see him uh, you know, flustered a bit, that why is she not talking to me? But in the end of the day, when you're experiencing certain emotions, communicate that to your spouse. Tell them, this is what I'm feeling. You have a right to express yourself. Don't think that you need to bottle everything in. Uh, it's not healthy for you, it's not healthy for your spouse, and it's not healthy, healthy for the marriage. And silent treatment only then breeds resentment because then he starts thinking, oh, I had enough of this. If she's going to give me silent treatment, I'm going to give her more silent treatment. And that is where um, um, you know, mount, um, uh, mountains are developed from, from molehills. So that was the, the topic that we discussed last week. The topic for this week, watch who you speak to. You know, as human beings, we, we have the urge to offload and we have the urge to tell people things, you know. And sometimes within a very limited, uh, you know, uh, framework, you can tell people a little bit of your frustrations. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't go into very intimate details with especially strangers and generally intimate details, uh, unless there's a very specific circumstance, you don't, you don't divulge it to anybody, even to your best friend. Now, here what happens is this is our girls club. Or oh, this is boys, you know, we're going on a fish trip. So now you start talking about, uh, you know, how often you are intimate or, you know, what your wife is prepared to do. Subhanallah, how can you do a thing like that? So disgusting. You get caught up in the moment and afterwards you regret. But now everyone knows. 
Uh, sometimes you divulge a fault of your spouse. So one is when you get caught up in the moment, you know, girls being girls or boys being boys. The other is now you're genuinely, you know, uh, frustrated with your spouse and you feel you need to offload on someone. And the first person who phones, now you offload. And afterwards you realize this person here can't keep a secret. This person here talks to many other people. And the next minute you're walking in the mall with your husband or you're walking at the shopping center with your wife and people are, are looking at you with a very uh, weird eye. Now you, you sit back and you say, hey, what has happened here? What's the story here? What's the whole issue here? We don't, uh, we don't realize that we need, to, we need to hold our tongue. Sometimes the closest person to you might not be the best person with whom to, to share your duke, you know, as they say, with whom to share your difficulty and your grief because that person may be, uh, what you call it, a person who's got a loose tongue. Or even if that person keeps your secret, sometimes that person is temperamental, not mature enough. We'll say, ah, leave him, man. Why you take his nonsense? Go and show him not giving you the best advice. So be very careful who you talk to. Don't get caught up in the moment, in a, in a light-hearted moment, and you divulge things that you're not need, you don't, you can't, you're not supposed to divulge, even if others are divulging it. What happens in the bedroom must stay in the bedroom. Idiosyncrasies of your spouse, uh, habits of your spouse, tensions in your relationship, don't divulge in a hurry. And when you need to, it must be in the right, to the right person in the right way. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. أوشك اليأس أن يغشى أمانينا فبالجهاد بنى الإسلام قوته when I come to the final segment of the program, Sunnah for the week, and we're talking still about hospitality. Last week we mentioned that a person who's not hospitable to his or her guest, that person is evil. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one who does not honor a guest has no goodness in him. Because you either may, maybe you're not honoring a guest because you're miserly, and that, that's evil, or because you're breaking family ties, that's evil, or because you don't have good character, which is also evil. So don't treat guests as a burden. No, no. Rather look at guests as an opportunity to earn the rewards of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, to earn the pleasure of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, and uh, to come closer to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Now the question is, what are the rights of a guest? You want to be a good host, but then there are people who can, who can lean a little too much. There are people who can take advantage. So what are the rights of a guest? There is a narration in Bukhari. The narrator is Abu Shuraih. He mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fal yukrim daifah. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day should honor his guest. Now the scholars say that according to other ahadith, it's mentioned three days. On the first day, you are lavish in the extent to which you entertain your guest. You prepare, you know, meals of the top, uh, top uh, level. Uh, you know, you, you spend quite a bit of time with the guest, etc. The second and third day, you can be moderate. Or some say the second day a little less, and then the third day moderate. And after that, whatever you do is bonus. After that, whatever you do is bansela. Whatever you do after that is sadaqah. It's optional. So the guest has a right of three days over you. And in those three days, the first day you must do the most. The second day, perhaps a little less. And the third day, you are moderate. You know, okay, whatever we were going to cook, we'll cook. On, on, on the second or third day, or at least on the third day, the first day you go out of your way. Um, you spend more time. After three days, if that person still needs to stay and you accommodate the person, that's kindness from your side. But the guest should also realize that I should not take unnecessary advantage. I should not prolong my stay unnecessarily because people have their lives and they want to go on. People have their routines and also people want their privacy. Some people just don't want to move. May Allah wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. That brings us to the end of this evening's edition of the Sulaiman Ravid Show. Whatever you may be doing, wherever you may be doing it, remember us in your du'as. Uh, we look forward to your feedback, uh, whether it's via email, whether it's via Twitter or Facebook, whatever you prefer. Uh, tell us what's on your mind. Give us some uh, suggestions and some uh, uh, thoughts pertaining to what we are discussing. Give us your suggestions in terms of elections and, and the focus that we're going to be having for the next few programs as to how we should tackle it and with who we should tackle it. And until we meet again, fi amanillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>